All right. All right. So, since we're uh, having the Lord's Supper, we want to look at that here this evening. So, turn in your Bibles. Oh, I forgot. We got to pray and do all that other stuff. All right. Father, we thank you for this time together in your house. We pray that you bless the moments to come, Lord, and uh, speak through me to every heart here, Father. Draw us ever closer to your side. We thank you for your love, your mercy your grace, your forgiveness, Lord. And Father, all that you have done, that we might have life eternal, and that we might fellowship you with you both here and in the life to come. Thank you, Father, for all your benefits. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray, amen. All right, so I believe this is the Word of God. I believe, this is the word of God. I believe every word of God is true because it's impossible for God to lie. Alright, so turn over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11 as we look at the Lord's Supper here this evening. There's a number of things we just you know, want to look at real quick. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, first of all, let's read verses 23 through 26. There, the, the Bible tells us for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He brake it and said, Take, eat, this is My body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of Me. After the same manner also He took the cup when He had supped, saying, This cup, is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, Paul tells us, right in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Now, some people believe that uh, Paul's a uh, letter to the Corinthians was written before the Gospels. And if that's the case, if that's true, I didn't check that out to see if that was accurate. But if that is accurate, this is your first given instructions about the Lord's Supper. And here, Paul is giving it to the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth was not one of your, your, your uh, star churches. It was a church that had a lot of problems. And the whole book of Corinthians is about dealing with those problems. And one of the areas they had a major problem in, in was in the Lord's Supper. Now, in those days, in the early church, they would have a love feast and then they would culminate it by uh, having the Lord's Supper. But that presented a lot of problems. And we see here in Corinthians 11 some of the problems that it caused. And uh, at one of the early church councils, uh, they said, hey, uh, we're not going to do that anymore. We want to keep the love feast and we want to keep the Lord's Supper different to remain this, the, uh, the sacredness of the Lord's Supper and uh, there not be the problems that there, there had been with that. And so a long, long time ago, they stopped doing. Now, some churches still may have done the love feast and with the Lord's Supper. Myself, personally, I think it's a bad idea. There's fellowships like we do back there, and there's a Lord's Supper, and these do not need to be connected. That's a fellowship. That's lighthearted. This is serious. Amen? And we need to be focused on what we are doing. Now, he said, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Jesus gave, gave Paul this information. In fact, we'll see uh, when we get back to our Acts study about the conversion of Paul that he spent three years in Arabia where I believe the Lord taught him uh, personally. The Lord had gave him revelations that he just didn't give other people. And uh, so perhaps in one of those moments is when the Lord gave this to him. And he, said, he says here that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So that's the night of Passover when the Lord's Supper was instituted. 
So let's real quick review some of the, the views concerning the Lord's Supper. Because not every church is the same. Not every church has the same view. Um, <clears throat> the first view, uh, obviously, transubstantiation. And that's the Roman Catholic view. And in transubstantiation, they believe that the elements are changed into the actual body and blood of Christ. Now, uh, I remember one time I was at a, 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 cl- a Catholic funeral and the priest, I still remember the priest saying, who, if, if you wanted to receive Christ to come forward at this time, I was like, wow, you got my attention. But it wasn't to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, it was to eat the cracker, amen? The little wafer, that, that's all it was. And that's not receiving Jesus, Amen. Now, in Catholicism, the, the, the priest will say the Latin phrase, uh, uh, hocus corpus, and that simply means this is my body, and that is the magic words that transform the elements into the actual body and blood of Jesus. So, think about it. Hocus corpus. Where do we get another word that comes from that? Hocus pocus. That's where it comes from, amen? Because, and that's what it was. It was hocus pocus because those elements didn't change. Any honest Catholic would have to say it looks the same, amen? Now, in Catholicism, because it becomes uh, the actual body and the blood of Christ, then you can't, you can't just get rid of it. So you have to save it. On, uh, in the back part of the Catholic Church, they have what's called the tabernacle where they keep the leftover wafers that supposedly were transformed, and they keep them there to the next Mass. The priest, well, what do they got to do? Well, they got to go down in the cellar and drink the rest of the wine. Ain't that convenient, amen? And, uh, and first of all, that's wrong to begin with. We're going to see that in just a few moments. You should never use uh, wine, fermented drink, for the Lord's Supper. And uh, in the Bible, if you're a Bible believer, you'd understand that. So that's transubstantiation. Well, during the Reformation, there came a fellow that left the Catholic Church, and his name was Martin Luther. And uh, he came up with the Lutheran view of consubstantiation. And Luther, Luther basically taught that the body and the blood of Christ were present and combined with the elements. So in other words, the elements don't really change, but they become the body and the blood of Christ, but they still look the same. And any thinking person would notice that. In transubstantiation, nothing has changed here. It's still the same. And Martin Luther was smart enough to know that. So he says, well, it's there. It just doesn't change the elements. All right, then there was another reformer named John Calvin who he came up with the teaching and, and uh, and these were former priests, uh, these reformers. Um, and once again, I have to say this every time because there's so much bad teaching on church history. Uh, Baptists were not Protestant. Protestant means protesters. We didn't protest anything. We did not come out of the Catholic Church. We were always distinct and separate from Catholicism, which didn't even start until about 312 and forward. And so we didn't always have the name Baptist, but we were called by leading members like Novationists or Donatins or, or something along this, na- the, this nature, uh, Paulicans. And so whoever was the leading speaker of the time, the movement was called that. But we believe the same. Do- the doctrinal succession of what we believe goes all the way back to the time of Christ. Now, you say, well, how how do you know that for certain? Well, because the Catholics preserved our history. I mean, we weren't writing books. We were trying to stay alive. We're preaching the gospel and trying to stay alive. And any Bibles that we have that were translated, they were getting burned at the stake with, with the Christians that held to them. And so how did our history get preserved? It got preserved by the Catholic Church because they were uh, killing the heretics. And this is why they killed the heretics. Now, you might think that I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pulling your leg on that, but I am not. I remember one time I was in the bookstore up there in Camp Hill, the uh, Barnes and Nobles, I think it is, 
And I always purposely go to two sections. I go to the Catholic section, and I go to the New Age section, because I want to find out what they're up to. And so I pulled the Catholic book off the shelf, and it had a chapter on the Waldensians. I said, oh, this should be interesting. Now, the Waldensians were Baptists like us, didn't have the name Baptist, but believed like us. And wouldn't you know it, just like I'm telling you right now, that book in the Catholic section written by Catholics was telling us why they had to put to death and imprison and persecute the Waldensians. Oh, they were such heretics. We weren't heretics, guys. We, we were standing by the truth of the Word of God. If anybody would logically do a historical study of Catholicism, it's very easy to see that Catholicism came out of paganism. It's paganism combined with Christianity, and they just, it, 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 that's how it came about, amen? When Constantine, when Constantine said he saw this flaming cross in the, in the sky, and that was a signal of God to become a Christian, is all he was doing is he was trying to keep his empire unified because he was getting more Christians in the empire than he was pagans. He never even got baptized until his deathbed. So if he really got saved, why didn't he get baptized? And there was no indication in his life that Constantine ever truly converted to Christianity. So now as time goes by, they merge paganism and Christianity. So they take pagan things and they attach names to it, pagan names to it. Even the whole Mary and Jesus thing, it is all the worship of the mother and the son, going all the way back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. And folks, we just need to be educated. We need to wake up, because a lot of people today have forgotten the evils of Catholicism, and in some countries where they can get away with it, they are still extremely evil, and the Pope is someday going to be the false prophet of Revelation and head up the one world religion, which is going to be new age in nature, which is just paganism, which suits Catholicism perfectly fine. So don't uh, be deceived by words and terminology. Study it. Look into it. You will find out. So, so Calvin said that this was a spiritual presence. What is the true view? Well, the true view is that it's a memorial. That's what it is. It's a memorial. When you look at verse number 24, at the end of the verse, the Bible tells us, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in what? In remembrance of me. It's a memorial. He says it again in verse number 25. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it, and what? And remembrance. So this is just this is a memorial. It's a memorial. There is no saving grace in this at all. This is a memorial. Now I want you to look at one more verse real quick. Look at Luke twenty two nineteen. Luke twenty two nineteen. I want you to see what the word of God says there. Luke twenty two, the gospel of Luke, chapter twenty two, verse number nineteen. And uh, verse number 19 tells us, And he took bread, and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in what? And remembrance of me. There's three times three, uh, where Jesus is saying, Do this in remembrance of me. Um, verse 20, just to complete the, the section there, Likewise also the cup. Now, I want you to remember, it says the cup. It doesn't say wine, it says the cup. We'll get to that in a little later on. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed, uh, which is shed for you. So, there you have it. The views of the Lord's Supper, transubstantiation, the elements turn into the actual body and blood of Jesus, consubstantiation, the Lutheran view, that the body and blood of Christ are present and combined with the elements. Calvin, in the Reformed view, uh, spiritual presence is there. And then the true view, uh, which has always been held since the time of Christ, it's a memorial. 
That's all it is, is a memorial. Amen? Do this in remembrance of me. Now, it's an ordinance and not a sacrament. That's important. The word sacrament carries with it the idea of dispensing grace or conveying grace. Now, once again, in Catholicism, and this is not pick on Catholic night, this is just educating you what the facts are. Amen? In Catholicism, you have the seven sacraments because what they believe is, uh, is that as you live your life, uh, and your, your grace level goes down. You commit sin, and this you have the different types of sin, venial and mortal and all this. And, and uh, so you have to go to confession, which is one of the sacraments, and all, all this and that. Why do you have to do this stuff? It's because your grace level goes down, and you certainly don't want to die without grace. So your grace level goes down, and you do these sacraments to bring that grace level up. Kind of like your car, right? You run your car, it runs out of gas, you go back to the gas station, you get more gas. Well, you, you, you're living your life, your grace level went down, go to the mask, bring the grace level back up. Folks, that's a bunch of baloney, amen? You are saved by grace through faith, amen? All the grace God gave you, He has given you. Amen? You, you are not going to run out of it. It is sufficient, more than sufficient. This is why people want to, that are in hospitals or nursing homes and they want uh, to observe the Lord's Supper because this is to them it's a means of saving grace. They have to get this grace. They have to add to this grace. So they need the, the priest to come by and give them the Lord's Supper. But folks, all that is birthed out of heresy. It is not a sacrament. never was a sacrament. It's an ordinance. The Lord has given us two church ordinances. Uh, some people believe three. Some people believe foot washing is an ordinance. I don't believe that foot washing is an ordinance, but we're not talking about foot washing tonight. The two ordinances that the Lord gave His church were baptism and the Lord's Supper. So what is an ordinance? Uh, according to uh, the Webster definition, an ordinance is something ordained or decreed by a deity. Jesus Christ was God, and He decreed the Lord's Supper. A prescribed uses, practice, or ceremony. And so here we have the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. The, the Lord's Supper. Alright, so now, what about the elements in the Lord's Supper? And uh, we want to look at the bread, the juice, and the eating. That's important too. All right? <clears throat> so first of all, there's the bread. Verse number 24, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And he's talking about the bread there. What is the bread pitcher? What it, uh, does it signify? It signifies the sacrifice of Christ. This is my body which is broken for you. His body was sacrificed. His life was sacrificed for our sin. Amen? His blood was shed, but the shedding of the blood is different than the breaking of the bread or the sacrifice of the body. It's a different thing here. So the bread is the sacrifice of Christ. Then in verse number 25, after the same manner also, He took the cup when He had supped. So, it doesn't say wine. And that nowhere in the Bible does it say wine in reference to the Lord's Supper. It will say the fruit of the vine or the cup, but it will never say wine. And some of the earliest teachings that are in existence today um, from many, many years ago, uh, about 2nd century or so, there are writings where they demand that the, uh, the well, in the writings they would say the, any juice or wine that was used was to be heavily diluted with water. All right? That, that's what it was. It was juice. It was not wine. It was not fermented wine. 
Uh, why wasn't it not fermented wine? Why, why was the bread, I didn't mention this, why was the bread unleavened bread? And it's not just because it was on the Passover night, though it matches the unleavened bread of the Passover. Why? Because leaven is a type of sin. And so is fermentation. It's a type of sin. It's always that. It's always depict that in the Word of God, throughout the whole Word of God. Jesus did not sin. Amen? He was sinlessly. He was sinless. He was sinless perfection. And so when we have these elements of the bread and the juice that represent our Savior, they need to be unleavened bread and unfermented juice. Unfermented juice. And so it says the cup. Now, what about this cup? It says this cup is the New Testament in my blood. All right, the New Testament in my blood. The New Testament simply means the new covenant. This is a new covenant. Covenants are ratified by blood. You see that throughout the Old Testament. When covenants are made, there's the shedding of blood. We won't take the time to look at these covenants, but they, they were made by the shedding of blood. Now, what about covenant? Covenant meant an arrangement made by one party, which the other party involved could accept or reject, but could not alter. So once this covenant is made, you can't alter it. You can't change it. You can either accept it or reject it, but you cannot alter it. This, what Jesus established here, by His blood, is a new covenant. A new covenant. Now, uh, the Old Testament records God's dealings with Israel on the basis of the covenant given through Moses at Mount Sinai. Why is it important to mention all this stuff? Because we're living in a day where people put this thing in a blender and mix it all together. There is an old covenant. There is a new covenant. There is a covenant that God gave to Moses that specifically deals with Israel that has nothing to do with the church. Amen? There is a new covenant established by Jesus Christ that God has established us in. And in the New Testament, and primarily Paul's epistles, explain the details of this new covenant that we are in. Amen? And so we've got to understand that. So the Old Covenant records God's dealings with Israel on the basis of the covenant given through Moses at Mount Sinai. The New Testament describes the new arrangement of God with man through Christ on the basis of the New Covenant. This is why we do not bring lambs and bulls and goats. They did in the Old Testament under that covenant. But under this covenant, Jesus Christ, once for all, sacrifice. Which is another problem that I have with the Mass. Every Mass is a repeating of the sacrifice of Christ. And He was sacrificed once for all. That's what the Bible tells us. The Old Testament revealed the holiness of God in the righteous standards of the law and promised a coming Redeemer. I'll give that to you again. The Old Testament revealed the holiness of God and the righteous standards of the law and promised a coming Redeemer. The New Covenant, or the New Testament, shows the holiness of God in His righteous Son. And at the moment of salvation, we become a partaker of His righteousness. What a glorious gift that is. Now let's look at a couple of verses here just real quickly, not to get off track, but to see that there's a difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I want you to look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's begin reading in verse number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 6. We'll just read verses 6 through 11 who also hath made us able ministers of what? The New Testament, which literally means the New Covenant. And so Paul is talking here. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now when he says the letter, he's talking about the Old Testament law. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth. You see that? The letter killeth. The law killeth. But the Spirit giveth life. But if 
the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. What was written and engraven in stones? Amen. The Ten Commandments. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be what? It was to be done away. All right? Verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? In other words, if the Old Testament ministration, the ministration of death, the ministration of law was glorious and Moses' face shined and that was to be done away, how much more glorious is this new covenant? Amen? How much more glorious? Uh, Verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Which means to be more glorious. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory. This new covenant that we are under is different from the old covenant and it far exceeds it. Amen? Now he says in verse number 10, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. And he's just repeating himself. If that was glorious, how much more glorious is this? Now let me point out this. He uses strong language like the ministration of death and the letter killeth. Why does he say that? He's saying that because that's all the law could do. As all the law could do was show you your sin and your condemnation. The law could not give you life. It couldn't do it. It it, it had the provision for your sin. You would offer the the blood of bulls and goats, but that would only cover the sin. And that was only momentarily because as soon as you sinned again, then you had to bring another offering. And so you constantly had this. And the high priest and the priest that served in the temple and in the tabernacle, there's no seat for them to sit down because there's no resting in that ministry. But what did Jesus do after He offered Himself? He sat down. He was done. He was finished. Amen? And so this covenant, this new covenant established by the blood, what the cup depicts is simply that. So the blood pictures, or excuse me, the bread pictures for us the sacrifice of Jesus. The bread was broken. Jesus was broken. And the juice uh, signifies that of this new covenant that has been established in his blood. In his blood. Now, what about the eating? What about the eating? Because it says, take, eat. What's the significance in that? Take, eat. Well, it, 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 it's, uh, it pictures communion. It pictures Christ in me. And all we that are saved as being one in Christ. So when I take the bread, I drink the juice, I'm taking it in, ingesting it internally. It's picturing Christ in me. Amen? It's, it's picturing this unity that we have as believers. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 real quick. 1 Corinthians 10. Let's look at verses number 15 to 17. Notice what the Word of God says here. Verse 15 says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. And so Paul says, listen, listen to me, judge what I'm saying. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are what? One bread. One bread. Amen? And one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) For we are all partakers of that one bread. So in the eating... Uh, It's not some saving grace. It's not some miraculous event that's transpiring. But it's showing Christ in us and our unity, not only with Christ, our communion with Christ, but our communion and union with one another. For by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Amen? 
And there's our communion and our, and our unity. So even the eating is important. Now, some of the false teaching that runs rampant today, absolutely runs rampant. Uh, you perhaps have seen books entitled The Meal That Heals. And they try to teach that uh, if you will take the Lord's Supper at home, you'll be healthy and you'll get well. You can't get that out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 without distorting the context. Amen? In fact, the Bible tells us just the opposite, that if you take this in an unworthily manner, you are going to get weak and sick and you might even die. That is the warning. And yet it's been twisted to, to tell people that, well, if you'll do this at home, then you'll have health and you'll have healing. That is a lie of the devil. That's not taught here. It was never taught in church history. It's a word, faith, movement, invention. In other words, it's all started in, within the last 50 years. Even less than that. Amen? And so it is not biblical and it is not correct. And, uh, and once again, uh, Paul says in verse 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry, wait one for another. The Lord's Supper is never to be freelanced. Well, let's get together at Jeremy's house. No, the body, the local church, comes together and we celebrate it together. Amen? Well, let's come together uh, at Jeremy's house and I'll get the wonder bread and the juice. No, wonder bread is not unleavened bread. Amen? What about, hey, let's gather down by the river and we'll have our wonder bread and our Boonesbury wine or whatever it's called. No, no, it is unleavened bread and unfermented juice. Amen? That's what it is. And so all this false teaching surrounding it is just that, false teaching. And a hundred years ago, probably less than a hundred years ago, uh, probably, John, back when you were a boy growing up and going to church, you would have never seen anybody freelance in the Lord's Supper. It would always been practiced within a, a local New Testament church somewhere. Amen? It would have never seen people just arbitrarily deciding to do this. Now let's move quickly through this next section just uh, to keep the continuity of chapter 11. The preparation for the Lord's Supper. So the preparation for the Lord's Supper is self-examination. Now before I read through these real quick and make some comments, I want to say this about what the Lord is telling us here, what He's warning us. What the Lord is not trying to do is to push us away from the table. He's not trying to, to get us to, uh, to be afraid and, and not partake. But the best way to look at it is to think about a mother. And it's dinner time, and she's calling her children to come in. And she opens the door and says, Hey kids, come on in. It's dinner time. Come on in. You need to wash up before dinner. You get that? Wash up. This is what God's telling us. He's not trying to put us away. He wants us to clean up before supper. Amen? So let's look at this real quick. It says in verse number 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, they're, they're, they're looking at the body and the blood, the sacrifice of Christ, the blood of the covenant, as just something that's... Uh, they're not taking it serious. They're not thinking about it the way that they should. Uh, they're... They're taking it lightly. Put it that way. And uh, uh, you can do this in a number of ways. You just go through the, the thing. Like, well, it's the Lord's Supper. This is what we do. And there's a real danger. In churches that do the Lord's Supper every week, that's a danger because this becomes old hat. Ah, this is what we do. You begin to drink unworthily. Uh, you begin to drink unworthily when you're not, you've got things going on in your life, sin in your life, and you're unwilling to deal with it. Amen? You're unwilling to deal with it. Unworthily when you're just flipping about everything. And live with the viewpoint, well, God understands. 
Uh, God doesn't understand as much as we try to say He does. Notice what He says here in verse 28. But let a man examine himself. That means to scrutinize, to look at, to put under a microscope. Let a man examine himself. It's not up to me to examine you and determine if you should have the Lord's Supper. That's between you and the Lord. Uh, before John Wesley got saved, he was, he was an Anglican priest. And uh, he ended up getting saved. But uh, I'll give this for John Wesley. Even though he wasn't saved, he took the book serious. And they were having uh, communion in one of the colonies down there in Georgia. And he knew one of the prominent women were not living a godly lifestyle. And so as the people were coming and he was giving them the elements, the woman came up and he said, not you. I refuse to give this to you. You're not, you're, you're not ready for this. Well, he ended up getting kicked out of the colony because of that uh, event. Which is alright because he ended up meeting Moravians who led him to the Lord. Amen? And so him and his brother get saved and do incredible things for the Lord. But uh, the thing where Wesley perhaps overstepped the line there is a person's to examine himself. I'm not to say, well, you can, you can't, you can. No, you need to examine yourself. Amen? Now, obviously, if a person is under church discipline, we know that that person's under church discipline. And if a person's under church discipline, it's usually because of an unwillingness to repent, then obviously we would highly recommend that that person stay away. But for the majority of events, uh, you just examine your own heart. Uh, so, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. He's not having the proper view and understanding of the solemnness of this occasion. He's not discerning the Lord's body. Damnation doesn't mean he's dying and going to hell, but he eateth and drinketh damnation. Think of it in the aspect of judgment to himself. How do I know that's the proper meaning? Well, look at verse 30. For this cause, because of, what the, because of what he says in verse 29, for this cause many. Look at that word many. He's talking to one church in Corinth, and he says many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In other words, many were weak. They were getting sick. Many were sickly. They already were sick. They were sickly. They were getting sicker. And there was many that sleep. In other words, they died. All because of their attitude and actions surrounding the Lord's Supper. You don't hear that much today, do you? We don't want to talk about the warning. We need to examine our hearts, guys. Every time we get sick, we need to examine our heart. Now, I'm not saying every time you're sick, it's because of sin. Obviously, that's not true. But it ought to be one of the first things we look at. Is there something that I have done? Is there something I'm not dealing with? Is there an attitude or an attitude? An, 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 what did I say? An attitude or an attitude? <laughs> you know what I mean, amen? Is there something? Is there something? Amen? So we need to examine ourselves. He says in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. What does it mean to judge ourselves? Well, I judge myself when I say, all right, God, uh, I've got this unrighteous attitude, this unrighteous thing going on in my life, uh, bitterness, envy, uh, unforgiveness, all that stuff. I've got that going on in my life. And listen, if you're justifying the way you feel, you need to repent. Well, brother, you'd understand. You would hate, if you knew what that individual did to me, you hate them too. No, we ain't got the privilege to hate anybody, amen? We have not got the privilege to do anything or feel any ill will toward anybody. What do we have the privilege of Christians to do? To forgive. Even as Christ, for, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. Ephesians 4. If we would judge ourselves, we say, God, you're right, I'm wrong. Forgive me, Lord. Once you've done that, you've judged yourself. Amen? 
You judge yourself. God doesn't have to do anything. But if you don't judge yourself, then God has to get involved. He says in verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. And this is why God chastens us, because we're not condemned with the world. Amen? We have been forgiven. We are going to heaven. We have the Holy Spirit. And because of all this divine privilege that we have, God needs to step in and chasten us, to discipline us. And He will do so. Amen? He will do so. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Now, we didn't take the time to look at it, and I'm not going to go back to look at it, but uh, from verses 17 through 22, you, that's what they were doing. They were coming together, and one person was saying, uh, this food is for me, and you can't have any of it. And another person was getting drunk. Can you believe that? Getting drunk. And, and all this garbage was going on in this local church. And that's why Paul says when you come together, it's not for the good. It's not for the better. It's for the worse. And they were doing this. That local assembly, this is what they were doing. And so he says, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry, wait one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. You see, Paul is agreeing with me. Don't combine the love feast with the Lord's Supper. Keep them separate. If you're hungry, eat at home. Amen? If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that, he, that ye come not together unto what? You come not together unto what? What's it say? Don't be shy. I need Linda Straw's ball here. <laughs> What's it say? Condemnation, amen? A congregation can come together onto condemnation when you're not doing it God's way. Amen? When you're free, freelancing it and doing your own thing. When you're despising one another. When you're living in known sin and refuse to do anything about it. If any man hunger, let him eat at home. That ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order, order, ordinance, order. Interesting. Just a coincidence. I know they're different words. When I set in order, I will set in order when I come. In other words, there was more that, that Paul wanted to say uh, to the Corinthians about the Lord's Supper, but. Uh, he wasn't going to write any more to him about that. He had other problems to take care of. He goes into the problem of the spiritual gifts next. And, uh, but anyway, uh, there was more. Now, you say, well, what is that more? Well, I don't know, because God didn't lead him to write any more down than what he has written here. Amen? And we don't need to know any more. We've got all that God wants us to know on it right here. He wants us to examine our hearts. He wants us to, uh, to not uh, despise the Lord's body and, and, and blood. He wants us to look at these elements and remind ourselves of the sacrifice that He has made, the great price it, caught, it cost for us to be saved. He wants us to take a look at that bread for a moment before we ingest it and think on Christ's sacrifice. He wants us to look at that cup and think that, that this new covenant that we enjoy, it came with the price of the shedding of Jesus' blood. Amen? There's a hymn that we sing, and it's a great hymn, all but one word. It says about His blood being spilled. You, when you spill something, that's an accident. His blood was poured. He was poured out intentionally for my sin. Amen? And not mine only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Is what John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And so, this is the Lord's Supper. 
in a nutshell. This is the teaching. So now we'll take a moment to have a hymn of invitation. Uh, perhaps someone needs to come and talk to the Lord. You need to come and pray about something. I'd encourage you to do so at this time. So Jeremy, if you want to lead us in the hymn, uh, Cindy will play for us. <laughs> 